Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest today. I can't wait to introduce him to you. He is the president of Universal Accounting. His name is Roger Connect, and today he is going to talk about the wheel of life and business with a QR code. So this is a very interesting topic, and I think you need to keep your ears open because you're going to learn a lot from this topic. So Roger, tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do, and I'm really excited to get into this topic because it's a very interesting topic. Certainly, Stacey. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. So Roger Connect, president of Universal Accounting Center. Basically, I work with owners of bookkeeping, accounting, and tax businesses, but other industries as well as a business coach. I'm helping them essentially build their companies and as it relates to accounting services, provide quality accounting services. So it's in that space that for more than a decade, I've been assisting business owners grow their companies, work on themselves, and focus on the things that matter to build what we ultimately refer to as a business that has value. That's amazing. I, you know, I, I love, you know, when you talk about the wheel of life and business. So when you talk about the wheel of life and you, re you refer it to business, what exactly are we talking about? Because some people may not understand the concept of the wheel of life and some people might understand how it relates to business. So can we dive a little into that a little bit oh, deeper? Certainly. Yeah. So essentially what it is, is when I begin my coaching, I first start with one of five phases and the first is engage and manifest is what we refer to it as. And it's where I'm interested in learning about the client. I just like to, first of all, understand why did they get into business? Why this is important to them? Why they're making the sacrifices that, that they do financially, time with the relationships that they have to go all in in their business and build the companies that they have. And this is from the solopreneur up to the very successful multi-million dollar business. There's things that are happening. And I want to know behind the scenes, what's making that individual tick as they run the company. And so it all starts with this idea of balance. And I don't use that word because I necessarily believe in it, but many people are familiar with this whole work-life balance philosophy of I've got basically two personas going on here. I've got responsibilities outside of the workforce. I've got responsibilities in the business. How do I manage those? And one of the things that's very useful for me to have a great conversation with my clients is to introduce to them what is referred to as the will of life and the will of business. And it's in that conversation, that exercise, that I truly get to go behind the scenes and get to understand a little bit of what matters to them. Them, what's important to them. And so that's why these two wills are so valuable in the conversation to help me better become a coach for them, really for what they need. Yes, I, I feel it's very important to understand the, the back scenes of, of why people do what they do, because sometimes, you know, people don't understand, um, you know, what ignites a person to go so far, because a lot of times I found that people have, you know, they, they'll struggle for at least 10 years trying to keep on the same idea, trying to build it, trying branching out all different ways to make it happen. And, um, you know, they just they just they just stay persistent and they're determined to to make it work. And uh, like you said, a lot has to do with that passion. Something in their life has has, you know, ignited them to really want to focus and to make this dream a reality for them. Now, have you have is it possible if someone is working on an idea for years and they're either plateaued, it's not elevating to the level they want? Is it possible that they could actually find other alternative ways to actually make that dream, that that vision that they have a true reality, no matter how many challenges come about in front of them in their way? Well, great question, because many do actually find themselves perhaps in a plateau where the excitement, the energy that they once had, the drive isn't there any longer. And so that's something that I regularly address. Uh, you've brought up actually a few things here that I'd like to address. One, you brought up passion. Sometimes we've, we've got to find a way to rekindle that passion. That's the energy that we use to bring in the customers, to engage with our employees, to keep them motivated. Well, one of the things that we first of all have to recognize, though, is as we're struggling in our business, oftentimes it's an extension of challenges we're facing personally. And what I found is when I go in with my clients and we're first coming into the business and seeing what they're trying to improve or focus on, they typically have hired me because they have some area of the company that they'd like to make different, that they feel can be better. Well, as we dig into it, it typically turns out that they as an individual have distractions going on that's impeding them from giving the business the attention it deserves and needs to take it to that next level. And so what we're finding is I 
I need to have a conversation with you about what's going on in your life. And as we address those things, then we can maybe remove those distractions and then get back to focusing on the business. And one of the things that I like to emphasize and why the will of life is helpful in this exercise is the fact that sacrifices are made. There are things that we as individuals are doing to work on our business that may involve sacrifices as they relate to relationships that we have. It might be hobbies that we have, things that we do that are important to us as an individual that we've given up, sacrificed, postponed in an effort to actually focus on the business and give it the attention it deserves. Well, it comes a point, there, there or rather there comes a point where all of a sudden we're realizing that it's gone too long. We've neglected it too long and we've got to go back and address that. And so I've got an excellent analogy with plates that illustrates it for my clients. I've got this whole idea of what it is that we can do to be better persons, better selves, so that we can meet our needs. And once we've had that that uh, need addressed at a personal level, we can get back into focusing on the business. Right. Because I, I think a lot of times when people neglect, you know, they 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 give up a lot of things that they once loved, things that really give them enjoyment, things that could actually help them mentally clear their mind, give them clarity, give them focus, give them enjoyment and help them grow as an individual. You know, they focus so much on the business that they're neglecting their own self. And then they, you know, that happiness is no longer there. They're drained. They're, they're that joy that they once had, you know, now it's a struggle to get out of bed. You know, they, that they had that ignition that we were talking about, you know, when you feel ignited with that passion, it destroys you and you jump out of bed and you can't wait to start the day. And all of a sudden, you know, they're dragging their feet and like, oh, another day you know and that that whole love that passion that was once there is gone because they have focused so much on that that one aspect that they've drained themselves because they have neglected so many things in their life that they once had it's there but it, they're not they're not devoting their attention to it so their their body their mentally physically spiritually their business is even getting affected everything you know all around is getting affected now you, know you've no, I appreciate you bringing that up because I'd like to define it very easily for the listeners. It's simply a switch. And what happens is for the business owner, originally the passion that they have is what keeps them up at night and gets them into the office early. It helps them work the long hours. And that passion is the excitement. They just continually are thinking of things that need to be done and they're happy to do them. But if it switches and it becomes anxiety and anxiety is keeping you up at night and you're becoming anxious and nervous, all of a sudden that starts to repel employees from wanting to be around you. It repels customers from wanting to engage with you. And all of a sudden, the passion that you once had that brought in the customers that engaged individuals to want to work with you, it now became, becomes this anxiety that people are now wanting to avoid. Well, that anxiety, if it's not taken care of, can quickly turn into depression. And then there's this evil spiral that can go down. And what we're trying to do is avoid that. And we want to get more to that passion and tap into that energy that's contagious for everyone else. So that's just something I wanted to share about that. No, I think that's an excellent point because with so many entrepreneurs and business owners that I've spoken with, a lot of times it happens with many of them. They mm -hmm. they they start to, you know, that that passion that they once had turns into, you know, all those thoughts and ideas and they're, they want to branch out and do this and this and this all of a sudden it's anxiety and, and they're starting to, you know, things aren't going exactly the way they anticipated it to go, or, you know, they've tried these new ideas and the end result is not what they anticipated. And, you know, and then of course, to make these ideas happen, they have to invest. So they're invested in it and then they're not getting the results. So then it's hurting them, you know, in, in the pocket. And so then, you know, they have employees to pay, they have bills to pay, they have ideas that they invested in that aren't coming through. And all of a sudden, this once beautiful, you know, business that they created, you know, is turned into, into a little bit of chaos, you know, and the more you think about it in your mind, the worse it gets. And that, yes. yeah, that's what brings that anxiety. And like you said, it can bring that depression and, you know, it, it just goes downhill from there. Are there suggestions that you have for people that, you know, can relate to this situation? Because I know there's a lot of people out there because I've heard a lot of people talk about it. And then, you know, you have you have employees that, you, you know, they still love their boss. But when he comes through the door or she comes through the door, they start to shiver because they know what to expect. And, and it's not good, you know, because the person is so under so much stress that energy is, you know, rearing through the office. And it's and it's kind of like, you know, navigating to the employees as well. 
Well, the first thing I'd like to say is this is something that we all experience. It's very natural. It's common. So experiencing it doesn't mean anything's wrong or broken. It just is recognizing that you need to focus on self again, that there's something that needs attention. And there's a variety of ways to assess it. The will of life is what we're discussing today. And it's essentially going into those things that make us up as individuals. And uh, I think a lot of people would be familiar with the philosophy of you're made up of your spiritual self, your mental self, your physical self. Well, when you get into these things that essentially determine who you are as a person, if you neglect any of them, all of a sudden they're going to be in need of help. And so take, for example, uh, physical. Um, all of us, I'm sure, neglect ourselves physically at some point, don't exercise, don't eat properly. Well, eventually it catches up to us. And then we realize, you know, maybe I do need to begin exercising again. Maybe I do need to actually eat differently. Uh, perhaps I've let it go to the point where I'm needing to get some medical help or maybe, maybe even medication. Well, that's fine. We're addressing the, the symptoms we're trying to address the cause and all of a sudden we're getting to the root of the matter and we're trying to make ourselves better again. That's very important. And it, it's at the spiritual level, the physical level, the mental level. Well, the will of life basically addresses all those things. And it says, where in your life do you feel that there's some neglect going on that if you gave it some attention, you can improve it? One of the best ones that I think is that of relationships. I fully believe, and it's a statement I learned when I was young, that no success can complicate compensate for failure in the home. And so when you recognize that sometimes even though sacrifice is needed in business, it isn't and it shouldn't be at the neglect of our relationships with our spouses, our children, our family, our friends. And maybe what it does is it causes us to realize all of a sudden, I need to actually take a weekend. I need to take an evening. I need to come home for dinner. And those minor things can make a huge difference again. And all of a sudden, what we're doing is we're filling that void and we're recognizing, you know what, I am a well rounded person, I can go back and still focus on the work that needs to be done. Yes, that's an excellent point. You know, there are so many people um, that, um, you know, divorces occur because of finances, because of the stress of, of, of money issues. And when you think of that, that that's pretty, it, it's, it's sad, you know, how much stress money issues can can bring into a family you know and you know and like you said you know it goes from from business you know when you're when you're hurting it in, in, in your in the business world you're you're hurt, it's hurt in all sectors of your life but once it hits your personal level when it hit, when it starts affecting your family your spouse your partner your kids you know then you have to really take a step back and say what can i do to actually improve this situation because your family comes first and that's what should really you know be on the minds of people and sometimes I think people lose priority because they're so engulfed in the idea or the business that they currently have. Well, they lose sight of why they actually maybe started the business or took the job yeah. that they have. It isn't because they wanted necessarily the successes at the sacrifices of these important things. It was basically to enable you to have a better family life, a better healthy life and so forth. And so I think we sometimes lose track of the means to the end and all of a sudden we're, we're distracted. And I'm glad you brought up finances. That's one of the things that makes up the will of, uh, of life is so many business owners are either undercompensated or they defer compensation as it relates to their business. And in doing so, feel as if I'm sacrificing for the greater good. I'm investing in my business. I'm going to enable its success. But at some point, you've got to actually recognize I have to get paid and I have to be paid what I'm worth. And so whether it be a little or a lot, we've got to basically give voice to that and recognize that finances are essentially there. And too often I'm working with business owners that do pay the vendors, do pay the employees, they pay the bills before themselves and they're paying themselves last. And that's one of the things that I'm happy to address with them because oftentimes it's nothing more than just giving them permission to pay themselves that they need to have. Right. And that's a big issue too, because I've spoken to so many business owners where a lot of them don't really pull out much money from the company and pay themselves. You know, that like you said, they're paying the vendors, they're paying the employees, they're paying all the other people, and they're the last ones to pull out money. And sometimes they don't even pull out money. Sometimes they they wait a week, two weeks, three weeks, you know, and it, when it's necessary, and they're not they're not compensating themselves on a weekly or bi-weekly basis on, on how much they're really worth because they're putting in all the 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 effort, the time, you know, they should be compensated for what they do. Well, there's also the 
converse of this. It's where I'm working with business owners that commingle funds and they think what's the business is theirs. And because it's the business, it's theirs. And in reality, they've got to learn that the business is a self-sustaining living entity that they're a steward of, and it needs to have its own financial means. Cash flow is king. And so it's helping the business owner, uh, business owner understand that what is the business isn't theirs. And they're a steward over this and they've got to be responsible accordingly. So yeah, there's two sides to this coin of, am I getting paid fairly, but am I robbing the business at the same time from its success, what it needs to grow? And right. uh, yeah, these are, I love these conversations. This is exactly what we need to be talking about. And the will of life is obviously one of those tools that I use to start these conversations. And, you know, I'd like to learn more about the will of life because you've been mentioning it now for people who don't know what the will of life is. Can you explain and, and go over some of the concepts of what the will of life is and what entails? Yeah. So essentially what it is, is it's an exercise where you rank a number of things on a scale of one to 10. And in doing this, you're going to quickly visually see where the deficit is, where things are out of alignment. And most of the times I'm dealing with people that will rank nearly everything a similar number. And then one thing's way high or one thing's way low. There's an obvious thing that stands out and you can emotionally maybe find this, but visually going through the exercise, it becomes a lot more apparent and it's easier to then address. So let me just point out what these are. Uh, first of all, it's career. Where are you at with your career? Are you liking where you're at trajectory wise with your business and what's happening in the company? The next one would be money. And this relates to obviously your financial position. Uh, it's it's looking at debt. It's, it's basically a variety of things. And it's interesting as I do the exercise, when people look at this one word money, how they interpret that. Uh, they all come with their own interpretation of what that represents and they gauge it accordingly. The other is health. Obviously, uh, it just, again, it's up to interpretation for some people. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm not sick. Other people, no, I've let myself go. I'm, I used to be a lot more active and a lot more, uh, uh, a lot more uh, healthy. And so, you know, they assess it for themselves. The other is family and friends. It's just basically recognizing how involved are they in the people that matter to them. And there's a great conversation that happens there. There's the significant other clearly there's that one person that clearly is very involved in our lives. What are we doing? Are we taking advantage of that relationship? Are we nurturing it as much as we need to? The other would be personal growth. We are individuals and we've got to take care of ourselves. And this is oftentimes where permission is given to take care of your individual needs, uh, having your own personal time. And uh, some people just, of all the things, they neglect that. They, they think they come last. And so we want to address that. Fun and rec recreation. This is a great one because oftentimes when I'm working with business owners, it's one of the things that easily goes simply because uh, at least myself, I'm a workaholic, so I'm happy to put in a lot of time. I enjoy the work that I do, but sometimes that uh, distracts me from doing activities that I otherwise would do and should do, and in, in for that matter, supporting family and friends and such. So what are those hobbies and uh, what did I used to do? What would I like to do if time or money wasn't an issue? And that's where it comes into play. And then the other happens to be uh, physical environment. Uh, are you in a clean uh, productive environment, or do you find that you're in a situation where it's cluttered and messy and disorganized? And people, again, answer these accordingly. And as you assess them visually and find that one or two that needs your attention, then we have a conversation about action items. Okay, what are you going to do to improve that, to address this? What are you going to do in the coming day, week, or month to actually turn this around? And from that, we get action items. And clearly, that's where I'm uh, fulfilling my role as a business coach to ask the right questions and now hold them accountable for the things that they want to do. Right. Oh, that that's an excellent, those are excellent um, things to focus on. You know, I, I find that, you know, when you mentioned about taking care of yourself, you know, the, one of the biggest things that people uh, do is they feel guilty. They feel a, a sense of guilt or shame to put themselves first, not realizing that, you know, in order to be successful, in order to have a happy life and a prosperous life, you have to take care of yourself before you can take care of others, or before you can take care of your business. And most people have a sense of guilt by, you know, of, of showing themselves a little self-care or a little self-love, taking that time out just for them. They, they immediately feel that you know, they should be the last one on the list, like you mentioned. Yeah, the analogy that typically comes up in this conversation is that of the airplane. We're always told that before you assist the individuals with the oxygen mass next to you, you've got to put your own on. There's no yes. way you're going to help others if you're not in a place where you're able to give. You can't give what you don't have. So those things really come up and illustrate well what we're talking about here. Yes, 100%. 100%. 
Now, when people when people do the will of life and they go through that, they go through the steps. It, it really probably isn't a, a, a big eye opener. Do you do you find that a lot of people kind of focus on the, um, maybe it, it, everyone's different? But do you see common mistakes or common errors or or things that people do that cause you know uh, a lot of um, um, issues in their business and, and causes problems overall in, in their lives, you know, do like for once, like we said, you know, they don't focus on themselves. They, they, they focus on themselves last. Do you see common mistakes that people do that could be easily fixed on a common basis? No, I wouldn't say common, but, uh, the regular ones that do appear. So kind of interesting, regular, but not common, I guess, is yeah, yeah. the fact that some people, they do make themselves out to be the martyrs. Um, you know, the, here are all my sacrifices that I'm individually making for my business. Uh, that's fine and dandy that you feel that way, but it's obviously, uh, you're, you're, you're making it up in my mind. And so let's yeah. just get to the root cause and let's fix it. The other one that may come up is the fact that people recognize they do need to make sacrifices, but here's the problem. So often in making those sacrifices, they now become embarrassed and they don't know how to turn it around, meaning I missed this game or I missed this activity or I stopped exercising in the morning or I started doing this particular meal. I started eating desserts when I used to not. And all of a sudden, you just can't give yourself permission to go back to what you would rather do. And it's it's where they kind of give up. There's so many other places that I need to give my attention. This might take too much effort. And in reality, I basically say, but this matters to you because you brought it up. Obviously, this is something that's important. What do we? Yeah. What can we do to actually give you permission again to make this a priority? And it's in that conversation, a lot of times people just start to remove the ego, remove the guilt, remove that embarrassment. And all of a sudden they're willing to say, you know what, this is a priority because at the end of the day, it truly is who I am, I'm going to now be true to myself. And so they start to recognize, I want to be a great father. I want to be a great husband. I want to be a great mother. All of a sudden, these things start to come to play and they really start to change their lives, which is the essence of the coaching. Yes, that, that's, a, that's, that's a great comment, you know, um, what you mentioned. And I, I think a lot of people do suffer from that, that ego and that embarrassment and, and, you know, and to admit that, okay, I made some mistakes, you know, and, and it, it's hard for people to admit that they made mistakes for whatever reason, it, they put, it puts a damper on their self worth and they, they feel, you know, it seems like it, it hurts their, their, their self image or their, their self esteem because they made a mistake. But in, in reality, we're, we're all individuals, we're all humans, nobody's perfect we all make yeah. mistakes you know and that's how we learn you know what is your intake on that well, I just think it's natural. It's it's human nature. There are certain things that uh, we're not all perfect in. And therefore, when we find and ident identify the thing that we would like to improve, it's just what's holding us back. And sometimes it's just nothing more than an ego. It's nothing more than embarrassment. And if you can just get past that, then you can actually embrace what needs to be done and go do it. Right. A hundred percent. Now you had mentioned about the QR codes. Now, what were you, you know, when you talked about the, the, uh, the wheel of life and you talked about business, you also mentioned QR codes. Now, how do QR codes take place in, in all this? Well, the QR codes are simply the easiest way for us to disseminate the information. And so what I have found is a lot of times people with their phones are having those in hand and they're just wondering, okay, uh, how do I get to someone this information? And so often the URLs are just so long and uh, PDFs, you know, I don't have the paper or whatever. And so QR, uh, QR codes have proven themselves to be an effective way for us to now just say, okay, scan this. It takes them right to the PDF, the URL, whatever they need to be doing. And we're able to quickly get them to whatever it is. It's just a Avoiding that issue of having to type in a URL and, oh, I mistyped it, I fat fingered it, or whatever the case may be, it just accelerates the communication. I don't have to remember anything. I just scan it, whether it's on a screen, on a piece of paper, whether it's on my phone, and then voila, they're off and running. And so I've just found that as a convenient way of helping assist uh, you know, people moving forward rather than, oh, I'll, I'll get it later, I'll do it later, or whatever the case may be. Right. And if you look nowadays, there's QR codes everywhere. Even mm -hmm. when you go into restaurants, you don't really see, you know, there are places that still use menus, but a lot of places don't even use menus. They'll have a QR code on the table for you to scan and to look at the menu yourself. Yep. 
It's really, it's, it's, it, you know, the world is definitely changing technology wise, you know, the, the world is definitely going in a, a different direction. And, and I think, you know, too, I think, do you find in, when you work with clients, do you find that a lot of people, you know, are kind of stuck in, in, in a certain, in a certain place of time and they, they're not evolving as quick as, as technology and the rest of the world is evolving and that plays a part in some of the mistakes that are made. Yeah. Yeah, now you're making me feel bad because as I get older, yeah, uh, technology is passing <laughs> me by. So yeah, I, I I recognize that there are things that uh, certain people are much more adept at. Um, I'm familiar with, for example, AI and uh, have interacted with ChatGPT. But just the other day, I was trying to take care of something in a camper trailer that we have. And my son just said, well, let's Google Lens that and we can find it real quick. Okay, he did that. He said, let me just ask ChatGPT what he would do or what we should do. And it came up with this actionable item and it gave us the part that we needed. I mean, what he did in probably, I'd say three minutes, it would have taken me much longer to do. And I, I realized I would have eventually gotten there, but the ease yeah. in which he was able to utilize these tools was quite evident. And my mind doesn't go there. That's the unfortunate thing. I'm I'm aware of these tools. It's something that, you know, I'm familiar with Google Lens, let's say. Uh, yeah. I've used it. I've tried it. But clearly it was the go-to thing for him. He just like, well, let's just use this and we'll just figure it out real quickly. So as these younger people become a lot more involved in business, I think they're going to be able to introduce to us older folk the uh, things that are available <laughs> that maybe we're aware of just mentally. We just don't have them as our go-tos yet. Yes, I agree. I agree. And it's amazing. It, you know, technology has, you know, taken a, a really you know, quick turn and there are so many things out there that, you know, that we didn't have. And, uh, you know, things that took us hours to do is, is taking people, like you said, like your son under three minutes to do, you oh, know. Yeah. yeah and it, it's crazy. It's, you know, and, it, and it, it's, it's good for business owners too, because I think it could, you know, when you're, when you're working in a business, especially if you're under a lot of stress, you know, you can go to these tools, learn about these tools, and they could actually, you know, help with reducing some of the stress by utilizing them. Well, what I think you're demonstrating here is just the fact that we just need to be open to ask for help. And that's one thing that I think a lot of business owners, uh, we struggle with. When we're running yeah. our companies, we think we're supposed to have all the answers. And as a business coach, what I'm trying to help them realize is the best thing that they can do as an owner is have all the right questions. If they can yeah. rely upon their staff, their management, their employees in just asking them the right questions, they don't right. have to be the be all end all of any situation. They don't have to have all the answers. I help right. them understand over time that in reality, at the end of the day, their role is best served when they ask the right questions. Yes. Oh, I definitely. Communication is key. And, you know, sometimes, you know, a, a lot of business owners, you know, don't want to uh, admit that they don't know everything. You know, it's an embarrassment to them. But it, like you said, the best thing you could do is ask the right questions. If you walk into a room, you know, um, and you ask the right questions, you're not going to know exactly what's going on, exactly what's missing and exactly what should be done. Because sometimes, you know, too many people assume. And when we assume, we, we don't get the right answers. <laughs> well, we, we make fools of ourselves is how the yeah, statement goes. So there you go. Uh -huh. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I think, I think asking questions is really good. And then, you know, it, I think sometimes, what do you feel about like businesses that, you know, um, maybe the, um, you know, the leader or the, the person in charge, you know, um, is, is, is more like a boss than a mentor. And then, you know, and then sometimes that puts fear in the employee and they're afraid to ask the questions. They're afraid of how the, how the person in charge is going to, is going to react. Is there anything that you can, you know, explain to help in that process that, you know, where employees should be able to freely, you know, you know, ask the questions, you know, and be able to, even if they don't like something that's going on in the office, you know, or in the business, or if some, they don't think something is run efficiently to not be scared and to say, you know, oh, I didn't really like, you know, how this was done. It didn't look, you know, it wasn't doing good for this, or, you know, it, it made me feel like this and, you know, we have that communication flow going on. Well, what you're describing here is that each individual, we as persons have different personality types and yes. as personality types, you also have different management styles. And so as I'm a business coach, getting to know my client, I've got to learn not only their personality type and how to interact best with them, but at the same yeah. time, I've got to learn how they are interacting with their employees. And what you're describing there is that cultural experience. What are they right. doing culturally to actually enable people to feel that they're empowered to make decisions, that they yes. have autonomy? 
company that they're able to do things because they've got the tools, the talents, the skills to do it? Or are right. you so limiting that you actually have everything drive through you? And it's referred to as hub and spoke. And basically in business, do you have everything pointed at you to where you're acting as the hub that nothing gets done unless you're involved? Or have you delegated it, given people autonomy and responsibility, clear objectives and KPIs that they can work autonomously or as teams to accomplish the task, not involving you unless necessary? These are all management styles, but one of the things I can definitely tell you as it relates to the business coaching I perform is I work with the objective of helping my clients recognize that at the end of the day, they should be creating or developing a business that is self-sustaining, that's autonomous for them. The phrase I use is becoming a self-sustaining living entity that is autonomous, independently living from the business owner. And what we're trying to do here is enable that business owner to have a life, to no longer be involved in the day-to-day -day operations, to ultimately have a lifestyle and eventually an investment relationship relationship with the business where they have key employees and key management that are running the company on a day-to-day -day basis. They're the visionary. They're the ones that should be looking forward into the future, not dealing with the day-to-day -day activities. And when you help a business owner recognize that they can be freed from that, that they ultimately should not be involved with those day-to-day -day activities, it's liberating. And for many of them, it's freeing. Some like the day-to-day -day and they get sucked into it. And I try to help them realize that they're devaluing, they are devaluing their company the more they're involved in the day-to-day -day operations. I agree with you. And, you know, and I hear that more and more from people that they, you know, they're trying to teach that same theory to business owners. And, and the thing I hear the most from business owners, well, if I'm not there, it doesn't get done right. You mm -hmm. know, and, and that common phrase that I hear from so many business owners and, and so many manage, you know, I feel like, you know, yes, it can. If you have the right staff or you train the staff that you have the right way, you can free yourself, you know, and it, you know, and they're, they're, they're stuck in the head. A lot of them that, you know, no, no, no. If I'm not there, it's not getting done right. I'm the only one that can do it. Do you hear that comment a lot from people before you start working with them in the very oh, beginning? Yeah. And maybe not before I start working with them, but it does come up. It's those phrases of if it's uh, if it has to be, it's up to me. If you want it done right, you've got to do it yourself. All those things kind of creep in. The thing you've got to recognize as a business owner is that it's not uh, that they won't do it right. It's just they may not do it your way. It'll still get done, and it may be done appropriately. In fact, if you've hired the right people, it might actually be done better than you would have done it. It's just right. maybe not the way you would have done it. And so what we're trying to do here is just let the business owner let go. And there are instances where I will I will meet with the client, we'll talk about things, and they'll share with me, you know, I let so-and-so run with this. I told them I needed it done. And they went about it a different way. And sometimes it's a story of they went a different way and it took longer, or they went a different way and used a different tool or system. But at the end of the day, it got done and helping them recognize, isn't that what we were trying to accomplish in the end anyways? Yes. And then any of those things along the way that you felt that they could have done differently or faster, you can come in and say, oh, by the way, I liked how you did this next time. Have You, you, know, you may want to consider doing it this way, or this is what I would have uh, thought. All of a sudden, you're just using those as teaching moments and you're rewarding the success. You're acknowledging the success of it having been done, but you're now pointing out and, and using teaching moments to say, well, here's how it could have been done differently or better, but still you're no longer, no longer involved in the actual implementation. And that's what's ultimately key. You're not going to be able to grow a business if you're having to do everything. Yes. Oh, I, I agree a hundred percent. I agree a hundred percent. Now, when you st talk about the will of life and you go through those processes and then you take them through all the questions and you speak about them and you get in depth, you get to know them, and then you start to learn about how they do things. Now the change. Okay. So now you've got, you've gotten to know them, you've gotten to know their business and all about their business. And then you fi figure out what the problems are. Now you get to the point of change. So how is that like, you know, how are some of the ways that you go about changing a person? Because sometimes bad habits are hard to break. And sometimes people are fearful of change and they're afraid to make those changes. So, you know, how do you ease them into a whole new way of thinking or doing things so they can easily kind of start to go on a different journey, a different path that's actually going to be more beneficial at the end? 
Well, there's two ways that we really do it, but there's a variety of tools we use, one of which is mapping the business. This is basically meant to help them prioritize things and delegate. But the other happens to be the will of business. And the will of business is similar to the will of life. But in business, we're just going to address what are those areas of the company that you're responsible for as the owner? And how do you feel each is actually performing? And like the will of life, we're going to rank each, each of these and from a visual perspective, find out what is lacking. And once you visually can see, okay, here's an area of the business that needs attention, it becomes a lot more clear where your attention needs to be. And then you can start identifying what needs to be done next. And with that will of business, we're able to, like with the will of life, help them realize, okay, here's the things that's going right and celebrate those. And here are the things that we need to be working on so that we can now maybe delegate or maybe prioritize things. And at the end of the day, they start to feel like they're finally, again, working on the business. And that's what we're ultimately trying to accomplish. That sounds great. Now, usually when, when people start to make changes, do you start to see, does it take a, a time? Because everything takes time. Do you, do, do you start to see results like slowly? Because, you know, in this world, the retention rate has become so, people are so impatient. They want change right away. They start something, they want to see results. And in reality, that doesn't always happen. You know, most of the time it doesn't. You know, it takes time. It takes, you know, it, it's baby steps, they call it. Now, when you ha have a program like you teach and you coach, you know, d it, does it take time? Do people have to, do have, people have to realize that, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, that it's going to take time, but you're going to see little, you know, changes and little positive notes along the way? Yeah, and I'm glad you brought it up because honestly, all this stuff takes longer than you expect. As eager as the business owner is to see something change or improve, it takes time. And there's a learning curve. There's an implementation period of time. And then it, after you've implemented, then you got to wait and see the results. And then you got to see where the results, what you were hoping for, what tweaks need to be made. And so there's this continual cycle, which is why I'm in business, which is why I'm their coach. It basically right. is an engagement that's going to take periods of time. And the way I engage them initially is to say, this is going to take 12 to 18 months. And some of the business uh, coaching that I do, I tell them, look, I don't even want to talk about results for the first three months. In the first yeah. three months, I've got to, first of all, figure out a little bit about you and your business. And then after that, you're going to help me understand what needs to take place and what we're going to implement first. Well, then we need to implement it. So we've got at least three or more months before we're going to see results at all. And for some business owners, that's slow. But I'm going to tell you right now, that's honestly accelerating the successes that they would have had otherwise. The things that they're going to do, I'll admit, they're probably going to be implementing or figuring these things out on their own, but it's going to be over a year it's going to be a longer hole, uh, road to, uh, to hoe. And what I'm going to try to do is actually help them accelerate this experience because I'm going to put the spotlights on the things that need attention. We're going to give actionable things that, that have deadlines and now they're going to move. So ultimately at the end of the day, I'm not necessarily saying that they're going to do things differently than they would have over time, but I'm definitely going to accelerate the success. Now, again, I'm tempering that. I'm accelerating it, but at the same time, it takes longer than they expect. Yeah, I think most of the time it takes longer than they expect. Like people don't realize the the time and the effort that that goes into things, and they and you know they think a lot of times they think things are a lot easier until they actually dive into it and they start doing it, and they're like, whoa, you know, <laughs> I, I didn't realize that this is going to take this much time and energy. You know, it's like you know, and they kind of get you know um, surprised by the amount. Like and and also mm -hmm. with with um, working with your clients, how do you keep them from not being overwhelmed because people easily get overwhelmed especially when you talk about the big picture and then you start to break it down and try to make it easier for them but you know what are some ways that you like to work with the clients so that clients don't get overwhelmed because with so many different responsibilities and so many areas and thinking about so many things and and then now they have to worry about revamping and changing things that's another thing to put on their shoulders you know how do you get them to kind of wind down and relax so they could focus and not get overwhelmed. Well, you're asking a, a very big question here. So I'm going to give you some short answers to address it. And if you want to go deeper, we can. The first thing is to recognize that so many of the clients I work with have a lot of ideas in their head. That's just natural. We think of a lot of things, ideas come to us. And the first challenge is, is we're stressed that we're going to forget something. I don't know about you, but as I get older, I'm worried, okay, I had a great idea last night or whatever, and something's come about and I have not written it down yet. So the first challenge is write it down. And once you've written it down, you don't have to be paranoid or worried 
that you're going to lose it. Once it's written down, then you can go about prioritizing it. And the process in that actually is really two things. One, I want to actually identify what part of the company is this addressing? Is it marketing and sales as it relates to growing the business? Is it accounting? Is it related to finance? The numbers are going on in the company or is it production? It's actually delivering that product or service profitably and efficiently. Well, I'm able to take that thing, that idea, capture it, now put it in the department that it actually applies to. But now I need to prioritize it. And the big thing that's part of the prioritization is, is this a short-term thing that I can work on and get taken care of in a day, a week? Or is it something that's a little mid, a little longer in term, which is midterm, such as a month or a quarter? Or is this long-term, something that's going to take time to implement? Well, that's important to understand because then I can gauge how I'm going to or work on this and roll it out. But the other part of this is whether or not you have control over the thing. I've recognized that things need to get done, but if I have no control over the situation, what am I going to do about it? So I'm aware, but I can't do anything. And so it's just, first of all, acknowledging where do you have the most control and understanding the timeline in which you can expect to see results. And with that, you can now prioritize. And then ultimately, if necessary or possible, you can delegate. And what we're trying to do is ultimately delegate as much as we can. If we delegate, then we're just needing to tell the people, here's what needs to be done. We're giving them a specific task. It's a SMART goal. Basically, it's a time-sensitive goal that is easy to obtain. And we're going to manage that. And as I go through these various things, what I'm going to address is the anxieties that so many of us feel of being overwhelmed, as you asked. And mm -hmm. if I can help them take all these things as a business owner that's on their mind, because we're doing everything. We're willing wearing multiple hats, I'm able to take this stack of hats down off of my head, put it down on the table and organize it into these three groupings that I shared. It's called mapping the business. And then we're able to prioritize and delegate. And that exercise is something that is so helpful to my clients. When I go through that, I have had people sleep at nights because of it. I've had people actually come back and feel relieved, no longer anxious. And so very much a very important part of moving from being overwhelmed to just simply being whelmed. I love it. I love it. And it's funny because when you say, you know, you have so many ideas, there's times where I've jumped out of bed because I've gotten an idea and I had to run and write, write it down because I knew in the morning I would forget about it. And so, you know, all of a sudden I just jump out of bed. I run to my desk. I write the idea down. And it's like, because I, like you said, I know that I won't remember it and I know it can be very valuable and I'm afraid I'm going to forget it. So, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, I think is really important. And I love the idea of, of just mapping it and, and, and putting it into three different groups. And, and, you know, because sometimes like when you wear too many hats on a head, they're, they're going to eventually get unbalanced and fall off. So you don't want that. So if you could break them down into three groups and then, you know, use them accordingly, that would take a lot of pressure off somebody to learn how to do that. You know, I think that's very a valuable uh, skill. Yep. Yeah. Once you take those hundred hats and you put them into three groups, you got, you know, 40 in one, 20 in another, 10 in another. Well, all of a sudden they're a lot easier to manage and you can now prioritize them. Yeah. It's a great analogy and it works all the time with my clients. I love it. I love it. Now, if you had to take today, if you had to take everything we talked about and you wanted to summarize it and you wanted to maybe emphasize some important factors, what are some things that you'd like to emphasize about today's conversation? Uh, the first thing would be this whole thought of balance, work-life balance is a misnomer. I don't believe it exists. I think people are chasing something that is not obtainable. What we're trying to do is basically take control of our lives and prioritize those things that need attention now. The analogy I give my clients is it's similar to something I heard years ago, which is related to that circus act we've seen where people take plates and balance them on a stick and they're spinning the plates, as you will. Well, the first thing you need to learn in life is you can only spin so many plates. You, you You've got to figure out how many you can handle. Somebody might be able to handle three, maybe you can handle four, but you can't handle six. Something's got to give. And that sacrifice is what we're giving in life, whether it be professionally or personally, for us to be able to do what we have. The second thing you've got to recognize is in our lives, there's a time and a season for all things. There's a time when you have the energy and the ability to work the extra hours or go the extra mile or travel and so forth. And that's fine. But at this next stage in your life, because of other responsibilities, maybe that's no longer an option. So you take one plate off, you set it aside and put a new plate up and you start spinning it. The sooner you can recognize how many plates you can manage and do it efficiently and effectively, the happier you will be. And at the end of the day, it's not about balance. It's about being productive and effective. And if you're efficient and you're keeping those things working as they are, you can be happy because you know what you are doing is working. And so you don't need to be everything and everyone. We're not all trying to be phenomenal let's say 
uh, parents while at the same time a phenomenal spouse while trying to be a phenomenal athlete while at the same time trying to be a wealthy individual. I mean, something's got to give. And for each person, it's different. And we just need to respect one another and say, you're being who you are, you're being genuine to yourself. And at this time in your life, you're doing what's needed now. I love it. That Those are excellent pointers. And and could you tell people a little about the services that you provide for, for people and business owners? Well, obviously, I work with business owners as a business coach. Um, I'm very limited as to how many I work with right now. But those are individuals that are clearly running a variety of different businesses. I have a number of clients in just different industries. But the focus that I have, my niche, if you will, since that's a common thing people bring up, is working with owners of accounting, bookkeeping, and tax businesses. I work with them. I help train their staff ensuring that they're able to offer quality accounting services. I refer to it as helping them become the premier accounting firm in their area. And so for that, I basically have individuals who reach out to me pr principally through LinkedIn, love LinkedIn, but also go to our website, universalaccounting.com. And there I have a number of free resources, some of which I've been alluding to today in our conversation. Happy to share those with anyone, with your audience. Just go to the website, universalaccounting.com, and there you'll find the free resources in the navigation and have at it. There's a number of great resources there to be effective in your business and be the leader you need to be. I love it. And we'll put some of those links in our description box as well. You know, this has been wonderful, Roger. You know, you are just amazing. Every time I talk to you, I, I learn more and more. And your knowledge is outstanding. And, and the, the knowledge that you provided today was so useful, I, I think. And I think many people are going to find it very valuable in their own business lives. And I, I thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing um, about all these different topics that we talked about, you know, having to do with the wheel of life and, and business and talking about, you know, um, touching base on, you know, really prioritizing and being efficient and, and you really learn how to juggle those hats. Because I think, you know, that's one of the biggest problems is that people just automatically try to wear all those hats at once. And, and that's where the problem begins. So you gave great information today and I thank you so much. And I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you for coming on the show, Roger. You're welcome. Yeah, this has been a wonderful conversation. Happy to con you know, compart all these things to everyone. And always remember this, if it's about business, it is universal. Yes. <laughs> I Thank you so much. I, I appreciate you being on the show and I have a great day.